It's a great honor today. Uh, this is the third Scribo seminar of the third edition of Writing and the Brain. This series was concocted so that we could invite experts in all things cognitive, from neuroscientists to linguists to anthropologists. And today it is a privilege and an honor and a delight to have with us Professor Carlos Severi, you know who he is. He doesn't need any introduction, but I'll, I, I would like to say briefly what he has been doing with his magnificent work and give you a little bit of his um, CV, of his uh, curriculum. He is today director of Directeur d'études at the École des Hautes Études uh, en Sciences Sociales in Paris, but he's also been teaching in the UAV in Venice for the better part of 15 years. He is a member of the Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Sociale at the Collège de France. He was Getty Scholar at the Getty Institute in Los Angeles twice in 1994 and in uh, 2017. He was Fellow of the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin at the beginning of the Otis, the Noti, the Otis sorry, and Visiting Fellow at King's College Cambridge in 2012 and 13. In uh, 2018, so recently, he was a Robert Lehman Visiting Professor at the Center for Renaissance Studies uh, in uh, Florence, the Villa Itarti, uh, affiliated with Harvard. You must know about his work, but among his many seminal books, we have La Memoria Rituale from 1993, Naven or the Other Self, 1998, which was written with Michael Hausman, and The Magnificent Chimera Principle, an Anthropology of Memory and Imagination, which came out in 2015. And his latest book, Capturing Imagination, a proposal for an anthropology of thought, which came out in 2018. He is with us today to present his work on complex picture writings, chimeras, pictographs, and writings in the Native American arts of memory. Before I leave the floor to Professor Severi, let me remind you that we will meet to, in, in a week's time uh, with uh, Professor Enza Spinapolice, based at the University of Rome Sapienza, who will be with us to talk about signs and modern behavior, facts and fiction, about early Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. This really looks like a really exciting um, talk. It's gonna be on Friday on Zoom as always, 24th of June at 4.30 PM. Thank you so much everybody for being here and let me leave the floor to Professor Carlos Severi. Thank you so much, Professor, for being with us today. Over to you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me participating in this webinar, so prestigious. And, uh, well, I am an anthropologist, so I've been working uh, essentially on um, what might be called non-Western material, which, uh, and I have focused on the question of the relationship between oral and written tradition. And uh, so yeah, I am, I am talking today about uh, essentially the, the logical nature of uh, Native American picture writings and their relationship with so-called oral traditions and there are ways, so to speak, to record, to represent and record knowledge. But I would like also to uh, <clears throat> submit a sort of general um, question that bef before entering details. In many, if not all, in this field, things are evolving fast. But in many uh, history of writings, we are uh, told that there is a sort of regular evolution, which goes, which starts with writings 
relying upon uh, heavily on iconic material. And then as we follow the historical evolution of these systems, we, uh, we will uh, follow a sort of process where the iconic means are weakening, so to speak, and even disappearing. And the result of this evolution is a, a sort of a conventional symbolism, uh, very, uh, which, which acquires a sort of independence from iconicity and ends up, so to speak, in a sort of a very sudden uh, uh, temporality uh, with the representation of the sounds of the language. Well, this way to portray the evolution of uh, writing systems is deeply wrong. Uh, and I think that we can uh, uh, show that for instance, in the comparison that I'm making between uh, Native American picture writing and what is called Mesoamerican writings, uh, so Nahuatl and Maya, even Maya, the Ponetais system like the Maya, uh, we can uh, capture and understand another kind of evolution where it is precisely the icon aspect which becomes more and more complex. So in the sense, we, we, uh, what I would like to think about today with you is the possibility and even the fact that our idea, our general idea of the evolution of, of writing system might be one-sided at the very least. So in my paper, I would like to pose two questions, basically. One is empirical. Can we identify a set or form of features that Mesoamerican writings have in common with other Native American picture writings? First question. And the second is more general and, of course, of more theoretical nature. So what could make a picture of writing complex, a complex representation? Well, the first question concerns the possible comparison between Mesoamerican writings and other Native American picture writing systems a perspective which is rarely adopted in earlier studies. I don't mean to suggest that the notion of pictography is never mentioned in the very lively discussions that specialists have conducted about this kind of writings in the last 30 years, at least. On the contrary, the notion of the pictograph is very thought in these debates. However, that notion everyone refers to is defined only in very abstract terms, usually extracted from typological definitions given in treatises about writing. Pictograph is the straw man, so to speak, is what one uh, real writing should not be in, in some sense. Um, remarkably, real Amerindian picture writings coming from outside the Mesoamerican cultural world have al almost never been compared with Mesoamerican writings. One may wonder why it has been so. Actually, for decades, scholars have posed an entirely different question, and they, they welcome deeply concerned about this question. They wanted to know whether Mesoamerican writings, writings were in fact comparable to real writing in some way. 
they, they um, for an entire tradition of studies, dating at least from Gerda, the study of writing the famous treatise of, of Gerda, Mesoamerican writings were considered pictographs in the weakest sense of the term. They were considered as being very far from linguistic science and thus unreadable, unreliable. More recently, starting maybe in the early 70s of last century, other scholars, among them Janssen, Elizabeth Doon, Alonso Caso, Leon Portilla, for good reasons, definitely decided to consider these drawings as full writings and started simply to read them with spectacular results. For one, as Boone frankly admitted, <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry, that decision, however, proved to be to have a number of less positive consequences. For one, as Elizabeth Boone has admitted, it blurred important distinction in the history of writing, in the general history of writing, thus making a comparison of Mesoamerican writings with other forms of writing rather difficult. The distinction is the paradigmatic one between the phonetic representation of sounds and the iconic or symbolic representation of things, which is very old and and foundation, so to speak, a distinction in the field of uh, the study of uh, writing systems. And, but it also blurred, I would argue, any distinction between Mesoamerican and other Native American picture writings, thus insulating the Mesoamerican cultures from other Amerindian cultures. Even, even neighbors like the Opi, for instance, were never considered as similar to uh, Nawat's stuff, for instance. Which is surprising from, from, a point, from an anthropological point of view because there is, after all, a cultural zone which goes from the Arizona, New Mexico till the center of, of, of Mexico. Well, the idea of putting Mesoamerica among literate societies for purposes of comparison also had another paradoxical consequence. It confirmed the traditional position between writing and non-writing and all the fallacies connected to it. This decision, even if it proves, it proves strategic for the development of certain kinds of, kinds of research, left unexplained the fact for in Mesoamerica, the use of this writing never covered anything even remotely approaching the totality of a language, even if it was a form of writing. And with certain reservations, I have no doubts on this point, it was a very peculiar one. So in my paper, I want to argue that this question of Mesoamerican writings semiotic nature might be reformulated in more balanced and specific terms. And also that there is there an empirical way to pose a fundamental question in the distinction between uh, literate and unliterate oral and written societies and this and that. And this also is a paradigmatic distinction. So I'm not just toying with uh, 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 Central American examples. I want to pose the general question of the relationship between oral traditions and, let us say, graphic recording systems uh, in a new way. And this is the real gist, so to speak, of my argument. So uh, let us assume that every recording system has two fundamental aspects. One concerns the kind of semiotics that it is inherent to the system, where one might list, for instance, phonetic signs, symbols, 
ideographs, picture writing, or even pictorial images, whatever that could mean. The other, concer uh, the other concerns the kind of information that the system is able to convey and, effective and effectively record. From this point of view, we may state that Mesoamerican writings, while possessing an inherent semiotics that associates them with many forms of writing and even true, it is phonetic writing, still have an ability to record information that is typical of picture writing systems. You can write down with these graphic systems, person names, toponyms, dates, number, and a few other things. Significantly, you have some problem in identifying transcription of actions, or verbs, or things like that. So that, that's an interesting feature, after all. Thus, Mesoamerican writings do not easily fit on either side of the traditional position with the oral and the written, because they seem to combine ways of recording knowledge that belong to both. As we will see, they bear witness to a very rich pictographic system that progressively included, in my opinion, in different degrees, some crucial forms of phonetic writings. The second question I want to discuss is more general. It concerns the notion of complex picture writing. This notion might seem at first sight a contradiction in terms. In studies devoted to the history of writing, pictographs are regularly defined as rudimentary drawings, used in oral traditions to represent basic ideas. Actually, this is a definition uh, given in the middle of the 19th century by a coronel of the uh, um, United States Army, uh, Gary Hoffman. Uh, <clears throat> Professore, scusi, odio interromperla, ma temo che non si veda lo, il giro delle slide, o forse dobbiamo eh, rimanere... Arrivo, arrivo. Ah, mi scusi, perdono. Non c'è problema, arrivo. They are seen, I, 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 I am just giving some preliminary general remarks before right. following no, no, no. my, my PowerPoint. But my if you come to at half a page. <clears throat> um, many authors have defined picture writings even precisely as devoid of any possible evolution, and thus of any kind of complexity. Gelb, in particular, has famously defined pictograms as dead and symbols, whose only possible evolution is to disappear as such and give way to the development of linguistic science based on the entirely different principle of the representation of sound. I would like to show that the notion of complex picture writing is not only appropriate and useful in the study of Latin, Latin American recording systems, but also that the theoretical definition of it might help us in building a new general approach to the study of many recording systems used in tradition that in kinds of tradition that had until now been wrongly called just or. So the, the two questions I want to address are, are obviously related. So I will present my argument in two steps. First, I try to identify a common set of formal features through a comparison between Mesoamerican writings and Native American picture writings. Secondly, I'll try to describe the process that makes a pictogram complex, both in visual and cognitive terms. My conclusion will be that the definition of this kind of complexity may allow us to change 
not only our way of categorizing writing systems, but also our understanding of the role that images can play in cultural processes of representing and recording knowledge. So let me now uh, get to my uh, PowerPoint. Well, uh, I think this part is more familiar to you. Uh, the relationship between picture writing and real phonetic writing has usually been understood in terms of a temporal sequence. Picture writings were said to proceed in time the invention of writing. From this distinction between picture writing and true writing on the basis of the sequence in time, a categorical distinction between written and oral tradition has been inferred oral and written techniques of recording knowledge has thus become the emblems of oral and written societies. The written societies were associated with a certain kind of social development marked by urbanization, economic growth, accumulation and exchange of commodities, centralization of political power, and a certain kind and a certain kind of social inequality. The oral societies were simply seen as the negative part of this, as the void of all this, which is very typical of this way of reasoning, which is opposed a way to oppose uh, us and, and them, so to speak. Well, David Wengrow, brilliant book on the origin of nonsense is particularly helpful for changing this traditional perspective on the historical relations and categorical differences between pictograph and writings. David, and I really hope that you touch with him, uh, he is at UCL in London, has shown in very convincing terms that in Mesopotamia and in the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean region, the period of the birth of writing was also the moment in which certain kinds of, com of complex pictographs in the forms of composite beings, far from disappearing quietly, actually emerge and increase in number. The invention of the cuneiform writing system in Mesopotamia coincides with the appearance of what he calls monsters, conventional graphic forms that have the unmistakable semiotic form and social function of pictograms. Wengel's book is very rich and it has its own fascinating agenda. But there is at least one point in it that we should underline. Even in the paradigmatic case of Mesopotamia, phonetic writing did not rapidly replace the use of pictographs. Actually, the two recording systems coexisted for centuries. What this means, what this means is that while the existence of a temporal sequence leading from picture writing to true writings may or may not be confirmed in this or sort of that empirical situation, it can no longer be used to convert a historical sequence into a typological classification of societies. Societies might be for long periods in history, not entirely oral, nor entirely written. This point is obviously very relevant for Mesoamerican writings. From an historical point of view, it is clear that Mesoamerica is a good example of the hybrid situations Wengro is talking about. As Jansen has rightly remarked, the two recording system that prevailed in Central America, the pictographic and the hieroglyphic, coexisted for centuries. One might say thus, that David's findings are confirmed, but what we know about Mesoamerican cultures, the situation where it might be added, the social condition for the birth of writing systems were similar.
to those in Mesopotamia. As you know, in Central America, we have a constellation of towns. In these towns, we had accumulation of goods. We have a, a very sustained exchange of merchandises. And we have a social hierarchy, very detailed and clear. So instead of pure written traditions that we can oppose to pure pictography and the dominating oral transmission of knowledge, we find a great number of hybrid cases. Furthermore, the Mesoamerican situation has another feature that, that contradicts the, tradition, the traditional vision. In Central America, writing, including in its semi-geographic form, which is only partially able to, rep to, rep to represent the present and its influence to the totality of the languages spoken in the region. As is now well established, all Mesoamerican writings, whether they fully represent sounds, as in the Baya writing system, or, in, or they incidentally interfere, as a colleague has said, uh, with language, as in the Nawajna, in Michtek cultures, directly record only place or personal names, calendars, and numbers. This is in no way means that these forms of writing are less powerful than others. It means that the process of reading them, a technical feature, involves the decipherment of a great amount of implicit knowledge, which is a typical feature of Nazim, Native American picture writing systems. Precisely the, those uh, picture, uh, picture writings that were never compared and we, with this expulsion, so to speak, of the uh, non-written, so to speak, societies from the, from the field. <clears throat> uh, it, so this is typical of picture right, Native American picture right systems. So I will argue in what follows that to comprehend the logic of both Native American picture writing and Mesoamerican writings requires a comparative anthropology of Native, Native American recording system. Rather than trying to determine whether Native American techniques of memory are true fits or mere mnemonics, we should explore the former aspects they have in common. So this is my, so to speak, the, the argument of of, of, of a life of work, so to speak. So I'm now getting, trying to summarize, summarize, and the point here was that the historical sequence transforms itself directly into a typological categorization of societies, so to speak. And we have no right to do that now, reality is too complex. In short, to just to uh, give you the, the the gist of the argument. But now comes uh, the uh, the uh, the attempt to um, summarize um, the work I have done on uh, Native American picture writing. So first comes fieldwork. So I went to, to, and to work among the, the Kuna of San Blas and Colombia. I was interested in uh, shamanistic chants. I wanted to transcribe and translate them. I wanted to learn the ritual language. And this is what I did. Uh, spending there the sufficient amount of time and uh, becoming uh, recognized by, by them, the, legit the legitimacy of this work, which was a very uh, um, long story that I'm not telling you. But let us, let us uh, take simply one of these 
documents that have been collected. It is called the Nia Igala. It is a shamanistic chant. It is devoted to the therapy of what the uh, Kuna call today low cura, which is a sort of uh, disorder, mental disorder, or a wide range of mental disorders associated with violence that I'm not uh, getting into today. The important thing for us is that I've been able, maybe for the first time uh, in literature, to uh, work on uh, extended documents of victim writing. If you take the literature before what is now done in, in anthropology, you always have uh, uh, scant examples, fragment, fragments, fragmentary documents, and this and that. So it, it is so easy to see in retrospective that uh, it was simple because the document was simple, so to speak. When you have uh, 1,847 pictographs, you can start to understand how it works when you, when this thing is done under your eyes and you are collecting in a parallel way the text that corresponds to the picture. So in this sense, uh, it, it, the Kuna tradition in the 70s of, of, of uh, uh, last century was a very alive uh, uh, tradition and practice. So I have been able to uh, 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 study it in a sort of a new way so this is, uh, I have 56 uh, um, sheets, like uh, painted or drawn sheets, and this, uh, that resembles to that. And they are to be read from the, from, there is an order from the, um, um, the right uh, downward right, first paragraph in a sort of uh, bustofredic uh, uh, way. And, and each image corresponds to a formula, to, a, to a, 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 an oral formula which is committed to memory. Uh, as, you, as you see, it can, these, these pictographs can become uh, 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 more and more complicated. And uh, uh, there is a first sight like this, you can sense that there is some repetition here. And, uh, and, uh, and what we can now show is that the relationship to a text never is lousy and irregular, as my friend Jack Goody uh, unfortunately wrote in his book on, on, on uh, the intermediary position between the image and, and, the, uh, uh, and, and the script. Uh, we have been talking endlessly about these things, so I still uh, 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 hold uh, Jack's work in great esteem. Mm, so, you can see now a document that this kind of document, the Nia with 1,800 pictographs, led me to uh, uh, try to understand how the relationship between uh, what is spoken out, so to speak, and what is given to the drawing, so to speak, uh, 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 might be, uh, uh, might be um, established. So let us have then an example. Far away, once can rises, another village appeared. The village of the monkeys appeared. The village shows its monkeys. Far away, there was the sun canoe's rises. Further still, another village appeared. The village of the snakes appeared. The village that goes up like a thread appears. The village that goes up like a thread reveals itself. So we are uh, traveling in the uh, in the uh, in another world, which is beyond 
the light of the of the sun. Everything is invis invisible because it blinds you, not because it is uh, somber or dark. And uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, um, looking for uh, um, um, something, some some soul, if you want, that is lacking from the body of the uh, ill person. And we are visiting sixteen villages where this soul might be kept. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, uh, an example of, uh, of two villages. And uh, let, let us uh, look at the transcription and picture writings of this passage. Uh, I'm speaking of the, of the, of the um, uh, inferior part of, the, of this image. As you see, uh, the drawing is repeating uh, the form of a triangle four times and uh, uh, appended to the triangle is always a qualifying emblem, so to speak, which is, for instance, the monkeys that appear in the inferior part, in the left part, and on the other side, we find the, uh, the snakes coiling up. Uh, so in this sense, this relationship we can we can state out so to speak spell out the kind of relationship in its more simple uh, uh, form that is established in the Niagara and the Shamanist in this way we have an iconographic formula a triangle plus x then we have a, so a constant a sort of image which is repeated all the time, and that corresponds to the word, uh, to the to the word village, Kalu. Huh? And on the other side, we have uh, a verbal form, which is not entirely represented in the drawing. Where is the canoe of the sun raising up in the sky? It is not there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where the canoes raising up in the, sky, in the sky is obviously a cosmological uh, uh, or, or cosmologically oriented uh, uh, definition, which is the east, of course, uh, where the uh, canoes appear, appears. So, I have to look to the east. And then, of course, there is this idea that the sun is taking up its own canoes to cross the sky every day from the east to the west. I am telling you a secret. The sun is a jaguar. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the... Uh, uh, to, in a way... Uh, that means that the symbolism deals also not only with what is spoken out, but also with what is not spoken out. For instance, when you see the two lines that connect the two triangles, you see a sun there, but not a canoe. So, in a way, we are uh, using two parallel symbols. One is the verbal formula, which is in a great part uh, committed to road memory, so to speak. And on another side, we have a graphic formula, the triangle, which is as always the same meaning. But there is on a uh, place, one locus, so to speak, where 
uh, uh, the drawing exactly corresponds to the text. And it is the variation in the formula where the name of the village appears. Huh? You know, a way where the Kansans can appear. I see a village. The village of the monkeys appears. The name of his village appears. And when I repeat the formula, I say, uh, where the sun canoes raises another village further away appears. And it is the village of the, which is the village of, of the uh, snakes. So you see that I am repeating the same formula and I have 16 times the same formula committed to memory. But at the same time, what is the most difficult part, so to speak, to give to my memory is represented both in the verbal formula and in the big right. You see that I hear something which is fundamentally different from our idea of writing, which is to say that uh, I am not to look in the drawing uh, to find what is represented in the linguistic part. I have to focus on certain foresight, so to speak, in the drawings, recollect a crucial part, which is always in the same position, which is a position of a variation in a repeated formula. And there, the two, the two codes uh, meet, so to speak. So in this sense, the result is that I have information in the verbal formula, which is not represented in the uh, drawing, and information which is in the drawing, which is not represented in the text. But at the same time, this is far from being a lousy, irregular, strange, and uh, arbitrary way to connect uh, two kinds of memory, the memory of image and the memory of words. So I'm here working, constructing, building an uh, spectacular implicit knowledge, which is both given to two different roles in this sense. But at the same time, I can tell you that my version of the Niagara uh, is, uh, for, for this part, is at the phoneme dimension exactly the same that the one which was collected in the 50s by two Swedish scholars. And I was there. Uh, for this level of, of work in the early 80s and in another village. So uh, I think that I can prove that we are not here using drawing in a sort of irregular way. Um, there is more. This drawing, this implicit knowledge, uh, is also based on the on a mental organization of space. Here I have to work. First comes the monkeys, and then come the uh, the, the snakes. So in this sense, uh, I have uh, a, a mentally oriented space, a parallelistic structure of the oral material and a drawing which is organized implicitly by that parallelistic structure. So I am here completely avoiding 
the uh, representation of sounds of the language, but I am transcribing the uh, structure of a discourse. So this is the visual transcription of a parallelistic text. And this is a condition. If I don't have a parallelistic text, I cannot draw uh, any uh, verbal material. So when we find, for instance, in the history of writings, the, uh, the uh, topos of this uh, unlucky love letter of a, of a, of a, 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 a Native American, uh, and we are shown that it is inconsistent, that it is impossible, that it is arbitrary and this and that. This is a way to uh, look in a blind way to, to a blinded uh, uh, material, so to speak. So I think that we can show that we uh, 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 are not facing that kind of, of symbolism. So what, I, what I've done after that, I've been trying to generalize my, my uh, Kuna model. So I, I, I turned to the uh, Plains Indians. You know probably certainly that the Plains Indians had, which goes from the Great Lakes, Chicago, near Chicago, to 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 the Hopi, to the to the desert of of of, of Arizona. They had uh, roughly, if I remember well, more than twenty four different and mutually non understanding uh, languages, but one picture written system, one system of picture writing. And we can use, we can recognize the same uh, logical features in this, uh, in these uh, examples. Let me give you, give you simply this uh, Cheyenne example, which is on the left of my screen. We have here a, a visual constant formula which is the figure, which is recognizably the same and repeated two times here. And then the variation, which is appended to the head. And that variation is not a little girl or another Indian. It is the name, the proper name of the person. So we now have that, for instance, on, on the left side of my screen, I have an autobiography, a picture, picture, picture written autobiography of a, a, a sitting bulb. The sitting bulb was not sitting, sitting, it was bunching. And I have a, here a mentally oriented space where, where on, this, on, the, on the right, I have the subject of matter, so to speak, of the, of the system. On the left, I have the enemy and appended to the head of the, of the person, I have his proper name. You remember the village of the monkeys, the village of the snakes. These were a representation of the proper names of the, of the, of, of, um, of the villages. Here we have uh, a very similar, uh, 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 example in the uh, Plains Indian uh, symbolism. If I have found in Berlin, uh, when I was a fellow of the Wissenschaft colleague, a fantastic example of uh, this uh, 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 symbolism. Uh, this is a Dakota Bible, a Bible, a Bible translated in Dakota. Where that was used as a sort of funerary object, and on the pages of the of this Bible, we find fifty six uh, big complex pictograms where the story of someone is told. And uh, uh, I I I uh, I've been able to identify 
the author of this of this autobiography. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of the way it, it, it is it is done. And here is a page, and in this page, look at the at the uh, at the horse and the cavalier on the left side. You will see that this horse and cavalier will be our triangle, triangle. So be our visual constant. And then we have his name. This person was named a bow decorated with feathers. And this is precisely what we find, what we find here. And uh, unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly for us, we will find that the formula, the visual formula of the of the cavalier is repeated several times. We have 56 uh, instances of this pictographic visual formula. And we see that sometimes this formula is decorated by, uh, commented by the uh, variations that appears appended to the head of the remarkably anonymous guy, so to speak. And so we, we, we see that in a certain way, we can understand in the Kuna, from a Kuna perspective, so to speak, this kind of symbolism, because we have verbal formulas and variations. So, we don't have the text, unfortunately. This is, but we know that that was a genre of the oral traditions among the, uh, 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 here we are among the, uh, um, the Dakota. So for instance, we can have, for instance, an instance like this. Let us see A, B, C, and E. And let us try to read it. I'm not following uh, the, the reading rules, but the picture writing rules. So we have um, some A is some rays, some fours are appearing. And then we have a cavalier appearing. He is with another man, which is the which is decorated in several ways. So look at the tail, look at the head. So we we are in charge, so to speak. We are taking aboard the visual formula, which is repeated, and we can say the CU cavalier is appearing and is turning in a mentally oriented space to the left, looking for his enemies. And then we say, see, oh, think our cavalier is here, but now is, is uh, 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 um, a stick is decorated by feathers. And now he's coming and appended to his head are cosmic rays. And also we can say, we now can name this person. He is the cosmic rays warrior. So in this sense, we could do, I've, I've done this experiment. We can, we can and look at what is there. A few rays of light indicating spirit events appears, announcing the appearance of the image of the calendar. The Sioux horseman facing left, so the active subject in the story, enveloped in a covering, holds in his hand a spare, adorned by feeders. He leads horse with its mane and tail adorned with feeders. And we know what, what, what that means, implicit knowledge. It is for funerary uh, purposes that the mane 
is decorated in this way. The stewards and and look at in the coring, grasping <clears throat> uh, as a spear adorned by the feet which hangs his cap. A few rates of light appear above the head of the human and his leg. So you see that 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 methodology that I have tried to to uh, uncover, so to speak, in, uh, show that uh, the that there is a sort of visual complexity, which is very typical of these uh, uh, symbolism. And this visual complexity entertains a regular uh, relationship with language. So in, we can see that here we have precisely what we were not expecting, uh, a regular, relation to language, which relies upon the structure of discourse in oral literature, and not in the representation of the sounds of the language. We have mental, mentally oriented space, so a sort of syntax of the visual indications. And, 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 and the, the Forgetting, so to speak, uh, uh, I'm mindful of, of of time, so I want to give you some sort of conclusion that we we we, we can already speak about that the visual complexity which is there is not at all arbitrary. So we have, so to speak, uh, uh, an inherent complexity of this visual complexity of this symbolism. And what happens is that it is precisely this visual complexity that evolves into the uh, Mesoamerican writings. I'll give you only an intermediary examples, but we can say that what Schoolcraft in the 80s of the 19th centuries, having married uh, 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 um, um, Osage uh, 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 person, uh, so having witnessed the real use of the inspector writing, he wrote in a, in a text of 1800. 48 or something like this, I'll give you the date if you want. The Indians have drawings transcribing key words appearing in stanzas they commit to memory. This is precisely what it is. <laughs> we, we, everybody had forgotten this, but it is precisely what it is. So if you compare this with the definition of, of Hoffman, who knew nothing about these things, pictographies are rudimentary means to represent basic ideas. So we, we can evaluate the distance, so to speak, between the apprehension of this material by schoolcraft and the mistaken vision of this symbolism uh, in, uh, in of. I could stop here, but let me uh, simply give you um, a sort of an idea of the fact that what we are seeing here is that the, com the, the this visual part may become more complex, but the procedure is exactly the same. Mm. So we will have, for instance, so picture writings are not drawings, but images in trying a mentally oriented space. They imply selection and redundancy, which is to say that they represent some focus of the information, but not all. But they also visually add information to the text within a specific technique of memorization based on the parallelistic structure of the discourse. So 
When we pass to this image, with, which is the combination of two different gods uh, in picture written terms uh, uh, among uh, uh, in the Codex Borgia, uh, we should not uh, uh, um, change of the universe, to speak, because uh, because uh, let me simply go straight. Uh, it is done in, in the way that I have shown you. You simply add information and you have clusters of these uh, picture writings and uh, you simply make the visual aspect of these systems evolve and become complex. I am absolutely aware of the fact that I'm, I'm obliged to, to get faster on these examples. But let me give you an intermediate to be found among the whole people. Um, let act here. We take just one example. This is the rep representation of an ego. Well, the ego is recognizable, is visual, is iconic. The, 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 uh, the head and the beak are there. And the claws are there on the opposite side of the image. But let us look at the wings and at the tail. The wings are composed by a pictogram, which means a prayer stick, which is a ritual object. And on the superior part, we have what is called in Hopi, a sky arrow. And then we repeat the same thing, the same pattern in the other wing. And then at the tail, we have a pictogram, which is called clouds. So we could play at the, using the method of reading this image, we could say the eagle, the head of the eagle, the beak of the eagle are there. The wings, the, the uh, right wings of the eagle are sky arrows. They are prayer sticks. On the left side, the wings are sky arrows. They are prayer sticks. The tail is there. The tail is made of clouds. So you see, here you have precisely a way it is what I call a, a complex salience, which is to say that we recognize uh, roughly an animal there, but at the same time, we complexify it in a way. So the proper name is the eagle, but the visual representation of it gives more information about this proper name. Well, my argument is that uh, actually it can be shown that in Mesoamerican writings, the, 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 so to speak, that can be combinations, combinations of not only pictograms, but, but even cluster of pictograms and uh, designating different gods, we have the god of uh, of the destiny and 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 uh, and the and, and another god. I am not getting into details. Are made the stuff that are made of are Amerindian picture writings. So to writings, phonetic writings and to oppose them to their cousins in the all Central and uh, uh, North America is a mistake.
Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much, Professor, so Sperry, for this really wonderful presentation, uh, which has actually um, put together a lot of all of your work. This is not just a token sample of what you've been doing. This is your full school of thought, your full whole uh, sort of, you know, Weltanschauung when it comes to writing. So I, to, to see such a, such a concentrated um, array of all of your thoughts is really exciting. Um, I have a few questions before I leave them to the floor. I take the privilege of asking the first one. Um, thank you so much for shaking to the extent that you do the foundations of what writing can do. Um, there is a point in which we are dealing with a lot of problems when it comes to the definition of writing today. People that study writing have suggested several many different definitions of what writing is, stricto sensu, or from a more broad perspective. And there seems to be not so much of a consensus at, as to what actually writing is. Because, you know, we, we know that basically writing comes from pictures, but not every single picture becomes a writing system. And this is a point that you very much highlight in your talk and in your work as a whole. So the, the first question has to do with this definition, because maybe we need to be broad minded and we to take into account with the examples that you presented, but also with other views of the broad definition of writing that takes into account picture writing and cinematography, as we call it in technical ter terms, as opposed to phonography, which is like more related to the representation of sounds mm -hmm. in a given language. We need to broaden our definition, definitely. Um, in total agreement with you and Elizabeth Boone when it comes to that. And it is quite uncanny that uh, scholars that have been working on Mesoamerica have had the broadest and the more open outlook when it comes to the definition of writing that takes picture writing into account. But we need some boundaries. We need to ask some questions as to what writing is. And there are systemic criteria that we can take into account, how a writing or a code is systematically ordered. Is there a conventionalized uh, standard? Is there uh, rules, as you would put it? Is there a system? Is it ordered? Is it systematic? Is it combinatorial, as you showed in your last examples? But we, we, need, we need some systemic criteria to um, sort of, you know, set the boundaries between picture and writing as it is. And we need to set boundaries as to its relation to language. So should we embrace the phonographic only? Should we embrace the more, the broader cinematographic idea? To what extent are physical properties important? Is it always 2D, two-dimensional? Is it always visual? Uh, is it always durable? And then there's the situational kind of, you know, uh, context. What does it do? What information does it convey? To what extent can it convey specific, precise messages? So these are the things that one should be thinking about when one gives the definition of writing. And I think you've, you've highlighted, maybe to an extent involuntarily, most of these, most of these. But then again, when we look at the inventions of writing and what we define as phonographic writing in China and Mesoamerica with the Maya and not with your examples, uh, with Egypt, with Mesopotamia, we don't have a, a zero point in time that gives us the beginning mm -hmm. of the inception of writing. Mm -hmm. And the more we as a group in our ERC group look into writing at its very beginning, the more we need to stretch it backwards in order to see precursors, predecessors and coded systems. And really that order, that sequentiality, that uh, mental organizational space, as you put it. So how do we go about setting the boundaries? It's really, really difficult. And I know it is a difficult question to ask you. And then I have two more, which are more technical, but I'll leave it at the end if nobody else has questions at the very, very end. Thank you so much. This was so rich and 
really a, a roller coaster of ideas and it's opening up new horizons for me personally. So I'm very, very grateful, Professor. Um, uh, I think that the first question that you are posing is really a broad, a broad one and, and a very important one. Uh, I would try to answer in this way. Uh, before minding about definitions, let us try to mind about status research. I mean, in the first in, in, a, in the first part of my my work after four years, I have published uh, things about this. Some of the examples I've been dwelling on in eighty five. So. It is a long time. And uh, uh, the strategy was to um, follow, so to speak, uh, uh, the a sort of very conventional, very traditional definition of writing, to oppose to it, so to speak, uh, what I was very much to call something different. But at the same time, this different thing was a third term between the oral and the written. So it pushed me to change com completely the strategy. Uh, let us, let us uh, try to um, take this positive strategy, so to speak. Okay. I am following, for instance, the Gombrich idea. It is very clear. It says, never mistake a sign for a design. Mm. Never. These two things are extremely different. And you have rules for a sign. You have no real rules for a design. And it's never. And on the other side, we have, for instance, a I've been studying logic. So I think that uh, any writing, any symbolism at a universe, and the universe of the, of the writing was the whole language. I mean, it was argued in, in, in linguistic, for instance, that everything can be, has to be, what a, a possibly translated into a sign, even uh, uh, even uh, uh, m or something like this. Mm. So there was a sort of a logical consistency that obliged you, so to speak, to send a write a full writing as something that uh, um, coincided with the language. Mm. Uh, and this is the positive strategy, and this is precisely what is pictography is not. So if you take that strategy, one would say, no, it is not right. If you take, uh, then I try to understand better the, and it was useful to, to, to have a quotation of the Saussure in mind. Mm -hmm. So Sir writes uh, somewhere at the very beginning of the Cours de Linguistique Générale, l'écriture disparaît dans la langue, writing disappears in language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I would now say that I'm dealing with writings that never disappear mm -hmm. in language, isn't it? So, uh, it becomes something, uh, just maybe a, a less naive way to oppose uh, writing to non-writing. This is a writing with a relationship to language. And it is that there is a part that is not disappearing into the language. But at the same time, it is, so to speak, embedded in the representation language. In this sense, if, we, if so, 
this is the way because there was something that opposed to something that was claimed by a student of mine, Pierre de Leage, mm. who claimed hmm, uh, a writing not necessarily uh, uh, as to represent the language. Mm -hmm. uh, he claims that there are things like écriture attaché. Yeah, one. And, but in this sense, then any kind of image become some sort of writing. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the trap is uh, uh, twofold. So to speak. I think that the first strategy would be to look at the logical constituents of the symbolism we are looking to, so to speak, before taking any definition, so to speak. And then try to uh, understand my deep conviction now. I'm convinced that the uh, uh, Native Americans invented an intermediary term between image and sign that simply we never dream of. And uh, so let, let us, let us uh, so to speak, uh, keep a at a certain distance uh, mm -hmm. the definitions and and try to first evaluate the uh, inherent of term of symbolism that include both icons that we, we can, could not call really drawings and uh, signs that we could not that could not really resist our classifications, so to speak. So I am a sort of constructive, a sort of contradictory notion, a position which would be described with a sort of constructive perplexity or something like this, where the thing to be saved is the fact that cultural differences can be either thematic, which is to say, corresponding to our fundamental categories, our music, their music, our art and their art. But I'm sorry, I mean, what is a shamanistic chant? Mm. The shamanistic chant is for images and words. Is this poetry? Is this painting? It is neither, actually, or both. So we should keep in mind that, that uh, uh, cultural variation can be systematic, which is that it strikes, it, it affects relationships between moods of or ways of expressing thought. So in this sense, I, I am trying to generalize, not to leave it, leave things as they are, but probably these doubts about the strategies we should uh, take to approach the field of writings, mean or might lead us to a better understanding of the sorts of cultural differences that we can think of. So in a way, my constructive perplexity leads somewhere. You've, you've strengthened my conviction that writing should not be approached by linguists or uh, archaeologists only. It, it, it takes a village to understand it, really. Uh, there's a question from Pia. I have plenty more, Professor, but I'll leave, it at, I'll leave them at the end. 
I, I don't want to abuse my privilege. Well, thank you. I'll just be I'll just be very quick. And I've seen there is a question in the chat as well. So maybe Sylvia, you you have a better voice than me today, so you might want to read it out. I'll just ask mine very quickly. Um, so first of all, thank you so very much for for your presentation, which was exactly what we were looking for. Uh, I am an outsider, so I don't work on I, I don't work on scripts. I don't work on on, on this material. It's, so I'm, I'm starting to learn, and um, I have I'm interested in one aspect. So the the process of conventionalization of forms. Um, that was well. You discuss it in your book uh, um, where, uh, when you you review Warburg studies and Stolpe studies, and uh, uh, they called it heraldic structure, if I'm not mistaken. So, from a prototype which is naturalistic, then we proceed more and more towards the stylized form, which we can still understand. And I was very impressed when I looked at one of the pictures of your book, and the same happened to me today when I was listening to your presentation and watching the pictures. I can recognize the essential features of these pictures to a certain extent, uh, uh, even without knowing anything about the context. So obviously, all the uh, there is a lot that context puts in, and you, you showed us that. But there is some extent to which we can all access the essential features of these images. So I'm interested in knowing what, what happens from a cognitive viewpoint in this process of stylization of images into forms. Thank you. Uh, well, that's that's a great question too, of course. Uh, I have been I've been exploring that question, so to speak, uh, with Vittorio Gallese on one side and with Stan Dern on the other, and. Uh, There is something about the way our gaze function. And so uh, the recognition of forms is something very basic in our cognition. My claim is that these system, systems, in a way, fundamentally rely upon this basic cognition and push to make it complex in a way. And so you have at the same time a level of recognition and a level of patient construction of an implicit knowledge. And it never goes away, so to speak. There is always this basic recognition system. And uh, in, in a way, I think that uh, um, these uh, different traditions, they focus precisely on what we don't focus on. So what we do for, for representing complex knowledge is necessarily to turn from the iconic to the digital, if you want to take this this terrible term. And then with digital, you can construct and you can evolve and evolve this and that or using the digital representation. What these systems want you to do is to think with without abandoning ever this visual apprehension of uh, image. So, so difficult to admit or to understand or to explore that as far as that with Vittorio, I think we, we agree. Then we disagree, but okay, we are friends. We agree on this. Uh, but the thing that I am doing, that I've been doing, has been commented, commented upon also by another uh, cognitive Splendid guy, Stan is at the Collège de France at this net. He has been studying reading. And this idea is 
the hand. Uh, the hmm. brain processes images in a different way. It processes the digital stuff. So we have this project in common, this virtual strange post, uh, 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 um, project in common to get to the Kuna or to another society where, where the people apparently are absolutely able of a very sophisticated and thought operation using images, but they shouldn't because what the, the stance theory expects from them is to be unable to do that or to do it in with another kind of cognition is not really, is they intrigued, but not really Uh, confident, confident in it. So the question again is open. This, this, this discrimination between conventionalized image and the digital sign is very much a field we should explore because it is not only of things that we don't know about, but also of our own prejudices. Mm -hmm. And it is a reason to conduct further research, I would say. Very interesting. There's a question in the chat, Professor. Um, do you think that the huge leap between iconographical understanding and phonetic representation in the evolution of sapiens could be responsible for divergent neurostructure? i.e. is it imminently monumental? And this question is from Ayn Sweeney. Well, <laughs> first of all, to ask me, <laughs> first thing I have to say is that I'm, I'm not sure I know really something about, but let us take the question in its general terms. My friend, uh, Pascal Boyer, Mm. A friend, a student, we were fellow friends, fellow students. And before getting to, to King's in Cambridge as a, as a visiting fellow, I've been a scholar there for many times, invited by people like Pascal Boyer. So, Pascal, his last book, the title is enough Brains Explain Society. The thing is that a number of fantastic biologists of the brain and all the Harvard group say societies explain brain. So in this sense, uh, I simply would say that we, I now, I, I, I love Pascal, but I think it's wrong and the Harvard people are right or at any rate, uh, this, uh, um, I prefer to describe a contested domain, a, 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 a domain of debate than to give an answer. Yes, very somber reply. I met Pascal Boyer two weeks ago, so yes. Um, any more questions from the audience? Of course, you. there are several uh, messages that complement you in the chat. Anybody? Inscribe? Inscribe question? Anyone? Well, as, as they think, I might as well ask my own questions. Um, again, a general question when it comes to your ethnographic work in the Nia Igar Kulukan and the Hopi and the Kuna, I wanted to ask you to what extent is this implicit knowledge required? Because, I mean, you know, the happy serendipity of this is that you had some texts that you co could correlate to the picture, um, to the 
picture system and the picture writing. But if you didn't have that, I mean, the extent to which we need to implicitly acknowledge that there is a lot to be um, to be uh, used in order to understand the message is is quite a key thing when one looks at, at context in which that message is not clear when we don't have the text. And then even when we do the text, when we do have the text, to what extent, what is the extent whereby we need to supply information in order to understand it? I, yeah. Of course, yeah. it varies, but I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, about the Nazi evidence in southern China. There is a lot of context that need to be needs to be supplied into the written information, written or the picture information, in order to get the even the gist of what the information and the message wants to say. And my question was more pointed in in relationship to uh, to your work, your ethnographic work. How much do you yeah. need to in order to understand? Because if it is a lot, then it's yes. much more complicated, yes. of course. And I'm sure that yes. that varies. And the other technical question has to do with something that tantalizes linguists that study writing, which is the presence of the rebus principle. And I was wondering whether you have come across the rebus principle in your instances and in the field work that you've done. Uh, I'm not sure that I know about. So rebus principle? The rebus principle, irrebus. Ah, the rebus. Yes, yes, I know that. Okay. Um, well, uh, the question of the implicit is very interesting, actually. And uh, um, let me use a distinction uh, that has been uh, um, that I find very useful. I'm not the author of this distinction. Uh, Williams is Berkeley. He proposed to have a two, two, two ways to approach the idea of a context. One is the encyclopedic context, so to speak, the fact that you have a sort of general approach uh, which coincides with some sort of knowledge of, of the language. And then there is something that he calls the emergent context, which is only what you need in, for instance, in ritual enunciation. So I use the term, I am not giving you uh, the old thing, actually. That was, that was a, a shortcut, so to speak, because of course, one thing is to, uh, to refer to what is not represented in the drawing. So uh, you, you, you see a triangle, but then the triangle is a kalu. A kalu is a village, a village is one of 16 Gala. They are, and then, and then you see, you get from the uh, emergent uh, implicit knowledge, which is simply the formula that you have committed to memory, which is not entirely represented there. And at the same time, and then you go further to further and further more gestures, so to speak, that could uh, um, uh, uh, lead you to a chain of associations which uh, point to uh, uh, with end, is ending up with the encyclopedia of the general knowledge of the Salonistic tradition. So of course you then then you know that the village is uh, under the under the soil of the earth, or it is with the sky, uh, with with some stars and this and that. So it it becomes the more and more. Uh, but the only thing, the only piece of knowledge that you can refer to to uh, show the fact 
that the that there is a selection of information in this symbolism is simply the formula. Mm -hmm. So you, you you have this this link to something that comes back to your memory. Mm -hmm. So you see, it is oral and mm -hmm. not oral either or or written. And another thing, I mean, I know you are. A, a classicist, but uh, when I've been for a long time in contact with, with some other classicists, the Italian one is Maurizio Bettini, for instance, when you find the first uh, uh, traces or, 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 or the first versions of the, of the Carmina uh, in, in Latin, they already have a form. Mm -hmm. They are not just information like this. So, in this sense, uh, um, if you can imagine just a, a, an image that would refer, it would refer to the form of it. So it is iconic and oral. That, that would be my answer. And I'm really convinced I'm really convinced, but I'm, I'm not sure that I, I really can show it. This is something that I will try to do one day. Uh, is that what, what, what is called in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the Greek uh, histories or in the histories of Greek art, the Dipylon style, which is this conventionalized style that we find in that is in Athens, the Dupilon, uh, should refer to some parallelistic poetic stuff. Because, I mean, it really looks like, but here I am uh, I'm advance, advancing in a, in a difficult uh, uh, field, but... Uh, no, you're preaching to the converted here because I've been long convinced that there is a system to the folly as far back as the Paleolithic times <laughs> that we can see sequences, we can see order, we can see all the ingredients of that mental representation of space, which is tantamount to picture writing. But this is another story. So you really are preaching to the converted. I mean, I, I, I think it's recent picture writing when it comes to the Dipilon vase, to be honest. It is my turn to declare an interest in this kind of research. I really would love to read anything that you have thought about these things because well, I, I should, really it, think that- I, I shouldn't it, say this in front of an audience, but I can send you my latest book. Enough okay. about me, enough about me. Any more questions? Fully understood. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Toma, you raised your hand. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. It seems to me that there are a number of different approaches to language. Uh, many of the Native American uh, generally relate the language in telling a story or associations with who a person is. Um, you get into many of the pictographs and I, I seem to find that you're looking at how information enters into the mind through many different psychological concepts. Um, the icons of what we use in, uh, in the West um, seem to have been organized in a fashion uh, oriented around a very, very, the very simple approach of our five senses and how our five senses enter or categorize concepts into the mind. So because when you have multiple languages and um, you try to take these concepts and either enter in psychological concepts or group them into categories and how they enter the mind. It seems to, to me, you really 
uh, have just lots of stories in the development of language. Each, each of these things is telling a story, especially when you start comparing languages uh, of, you know, uh, the idea it seems that there is something that can take you back in history to find where that process started. And much of our knowledge uh, and, and the way we think has seemed to develop along the lines of the language in that way. Yeah. Is, that, is that clear or, or too it vague? Is clear. It is clear and very important to me, very interesting uh, remark. And it, it calls for a number of, of answers. <clears throat> Well, first of all, thank you for having part and trying to use some psychological concepts in the understanding of these arts of memory, so to speak, of whatever you want to call them. Uh, actually, my definition is, is, take, is three sums, so to speak, takes, takes up three aspects. Uh, one is a semiotic aspect, and uh, it, it opposes salience of the speech to order and sounds. And uh, of course, I, I, nev I never have isolated uh, saliences, and I never have ordered sequences without salience. So, in this sense, I think that there is a sort of cognitive foundation of this thing. And uh, I am not superimposing it. The more I work on these techniques, and I've been working on now, uh, uh, I, I find different combination of this, of, of saying and so there, but it, so to speak, the procedure is the same, but the complexity is different. I have, and then I have a, 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 oh, sorry, this is the semiotic part. The psychologic part, right, semiotic and psychological, so to speak, is, of course, salience is for re recalling, retrieval. And order is for encoding memory. So the, beyond the, the, the thing of the salient, and you, uh, there, there is more basic stuff, so to speak. And this is uh, encoding and retrieval, obeying to different. Uh, uh. Then there is a logic, what I found useful also. For instance, for defining the notion of uh, what to do with the, with the definition of, of writing, is that typically in, in phonetic writing, uh, uh, the power and the expressivity of a language, which is the possibility of telling few things about an enormous amount of objects, uh, this power, expressivity, to say an enormous amount of, uh, sorry, power is the possibility to predicate as a few number of things about a great number of subjects. Expressivity is the possibility to have an enormous amount of predicates on several few subjects, so to speak. It is typical of writing, uh, of phonetic writing, that this equilibrium, logic equilibrium, which is typical of human language, stays the same. Mm. My systems are very expressive and extremely uh, uh, used or spent in power. So you see what I'm trying to, it is also a way to respond to, to Silvia Ferrara. To, there are other ways to, to go in this uh, uh, direction of understanding or on evaluating the, um, the logic, uh, uh, the way to situate in a general logic, so to speak, the systems I am writing, uh, I am writing about. 
then there is the question of, of, the, of the story. I think you're right, uh, of course. The story is one of the paradigmatic way to organize knowledge. Yes. But I, I, and, and the history of the memory, of the psychological, of the psychology of memory is full of examples of exploring uh, stories. But in these stories, there is always a sort of iconic uh, uh, presence. And in general, I've been devoting myself to the iconic organization of mnemonic images. So this is just a choice. And one day I will have to work on histories or, or stories. I'm sure if, I, if I'm young enough, I'll, I'll try. But uh, there is also the fact that uh, the image of that is very important in the tradition of I have uh, been working on. For instance, uh, you, you see, you see, and I think you're right in this shamanistic chance stories. But actually, parallelism is also a way to tell a story, but it is it is it is something that goes against the flowing of narrative functions, so to speak, to the point that one of the embarrassing things that we have discovered in anthropology and in the 70s, it was understood as, in, as a sort of incidental feature, and it is not. These texts are not to be understood by people. So uh, what they offer to the general public is the image of a speaker which alternates understandable fact very much the way Pia was uh, uh, saying about images. So you, 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 you catch some, some meaning from time to time. And then you have an enormous amount of ver verbal material, which is not devoid of meaning, but it is not understandable by people. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a genre of literature, which is very intriguing and cannot be reduced easily from an anthropological point of view to the paradigmatic uh, example. This is the reason why, but I, I think that we are absolutely right in posing the question. Okay, any more questions? No, no more questions? Professor, I have a few more, but I'm gonna spare them to you and everybody Everybody else. I'll send you an email. We can have another Zoom call, you and I, and discuss them because for me, this discussion should not end, but I don't want to I don't want to keep everybody for too long. It's already been two hours, but it was wonderful. It was really, really wonderful and very rich. And I think you really have contributed to shaking foundations. And it's much needed for us linguists and classicists and archaeologists. We really need to look at the dichotomy between oral and written tradition with different glasses, different lenses that break up that dichotomy as much as possible. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Severi, for, for having accepted our uh, invitation. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, let us uh, keep this dialogue alive. I will sure that we do. And thank you everybody for being here. It was lovely to see you all. And we'll see you in a week's time with Professor Enza Spinopolice from Sapienza University. And she's going to be talking about Homo sapiens and Neanderthals and their uh, very modern behavior in terms of sign making. 
So we'll see you then at 4.30 as usual on Zoom. We'll send a link very soon. Uh, keep in tune with our um, media channels and you'll hear from us very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Professor Severi, again. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.